Hello and welcome to the video version of Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient times to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with Robert Lynn Fuller, author of After D-Day, The U.S. Army Encounters the French, published February 24th, 2021 by Louisiana State University Press. Thank you very much for speaking with me. It's my pleasure. So first, how did you get into um, studying this subject and writing a book on it? I was uh, a professor of modern European history with a specialty in modern France. Mm -hmm. And uh, a colleague of mine in the uh, math department knew that uh, when um, someone in the defense department, I think it was the defense department, someone in the Bush administration anyway, mm -hmm in the run up to the war in Iraq said that the uh, occupation of uh, Iraq wasn't even going to be like the occupation of Germany after World War II, it was going to be more like the occupation of France. So my, uh, my friend asked me, so what was the occupation, American occupation of France like? Was it a complete snafu? And um, I had to admit to him, I really didn't know very much about it. So uh, I tried to find out something about it. And the first thing I found out was that there'd been almost no work done on the subject. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was a, an, uh, an empty field practically. Uh, so I decided, well, you know, that might make a pretty good project. But that was back then, that was uh, 2003. Uh, I had other irons in the fire at the time. So I put this on a, a back burner and uh, eventually decided to, to uh, get on with it uh, about, in, 2011. So I picked it up again in 2011. Now, by then, actually, uh, some other works had appeared. Um, and uh, it was no longer uh, all by itself. Although, uh, oddly enough, I, I didn't even know that until uh, uh, I, I had already started my project. It was well into it. Okay. So um, tell me about the book then. How, how do you lay it out? Is it a chronological history of what happened? Or is it a little more thematic in the breakdown? Well, uh, it was originally one book, but turned out to be two. Hmm. So here's, here's the book we're talking about today, After D-Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's the other half called The Struggle for Cooperation. Okay. Um, they were uh, together. I wrote them as one, one work, but hmm. I was unable to sell them as one work. So uh, an editor suggested to me, why don't you break them into two? So I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the first one one we're talking about today after D-Day mm -hmm. uh, is pretty much chronological. And uh, I start with uh, the lead up to um, American involvement in the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and it carries on straight through a little bit, a little bit uh, it, right up to VE day. Uh, mostly it's over by January of 1945. Um, because uh, by then, most of France had been liberated and uh, the liberation period was effectively over by then. So uh, the, my story of, of the encounter between the French and the Americans during the liberation period uh, is finished. However, the second book then carries on with um, how did the Americans and the French get along after the liberation with the Americans still maintaining a very, very large military establishment in France while the war continued against Germany. Uh, and that is not really, that one's not chronological. That one really is thematic. It takes up different subjects of uh, friction, really. Uh, mm -hmm. the, what, were the, what were the problems in the relationship and how did they handle them? So, um, so, of course, France was divided at the time. There was, I guess, occupied France and there was Vichy France. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I, that's correct, isn't it? Or well, it depends what you mean by at the time. At the time of the uh, of D Day, no, mm -hmm. uh, all of France was occupied by then. All of France was occupied on November eleventh, uh, nineteen forty two, mm -hmm. after the uh, Allies had launched the invasion of North Africa, and uh, the French troops and the French administration in North Africa uh, signed an armistice uh, and stopped fighting after about four or five days. Mm -hmm. Uh, against the wishes of uh, the leader of, of uh, occupied France and, and unoccupied France, Vichy. We call it Vichy France. Uh, that was the Marshal uh, Philippe Pétain. And Pétain had actually ordered them to keep fighting, but they, they couldn't see any reason to, <laughs> to carry, on, carry on fighting, so they stopped. 
Uh, and when they stopped, that's when the Germans then occupied all of France. Oh, I see. Okay. I, so just thinking about what, what the person said to you, you know, what would the, the occupation of, of Iraq be like? And it would be like, you know, France, like, what does that mean? What was going on that was problematic? Oh, <laughs> well, part of the problem was with the two different leaders. Uh, one was named Roosevelt and the other was named de Gaulle, mm -hmm. uh, who mostly loathed each other. Um, mm -hmm. One of the issues that I had, one of the questions I wanted to answer when I first undertook this project was uh, I knew that Roosevelt withhold formal, withheld formal recognition of de Gaulle's government until October 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, de Gaulle had set up his government in August of 1944 in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he's already there for, uh, what is that, three months um, before Roosevelt decided, okay, we'll finally accept de Gaulle as the head of the French government and we'll now establish formal relations. So my question was, well, what happened in the meantime? I mean, before we actually recognized de Gaulle's government, how did the, the French and the Americans get along? Uh, and the answer to that question ended up being fairly simple, actually. Um, the relations were really between the French, oh, excuse me, between the American military, i.e. Eisenhower, uh, and, uh, and de Gaulle. Uh, and he could either accept de Gaulle as the head of the government or the head of the French military. It didn't make any difference as far as Eisenhower was concerned. It was just, you know, they were the French authorities. Uh, and he dealt with them quite easily. Uh, and Eisenhower actually got along with de Gaulle pretty well. Uh, so there wasn't any real friction between Eisenhower and de Gaulle. Well, there was, but mm -hmm. it was minor stuff. I mean, ep episodically there was. Uh, mm -hmm. But overall, they, they got along just fine. Mm -hmm. um, so what were the issues? Well, one of the issues were is the Americans claimed that any German booty that fell into anybody's hands, whether it be French or American, was property of the U.S. Army, which is kind of, I mean, I suppose there's an explanation for why they adopted that policy, but I don't know what the explanation was. Uh, so that the French in some town, say, would liberate their own town. And they'd seize all this, this German supplies, whether it be ammunition or food or horses or you, what have you. And uh, the Americans would come into town and say, okay, that's ours. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, we, we, uh, we, we need this, uh, whether it be loads of tires or gasoline or whatever it might be. And uh, the Americans continue to insist on this policy right up uh, to the end of the war. And I, I, I don't really have an explanation of that. Uh, and one reason I don't have an explanation of that is that I set out not to write a history of Schaeff. Uh, this is not uh, Schaeff being the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not an institutional history. It's not a inst uh, history of the formation of policy. Uh, it's a history of how policy actually worked. You know, what happened? Uh, how, did, how were these policies carried out? And so I know how the policies were carried out to, in, in many ways. Um, but uh, what the rationale was, I, I frankly, I, I couldn't tell you that. I, I don't know. Mm. Um, but another one of the major frictions was treatment of German POWs, yeah. because uh, there were many, many hundreds of thousands of German POWs that were held in uh, uh, prisoner war camps in France. And uh, the Allies, particularly the Americans, insisted on following the Geneva Convention that, uh, you know, if they were going to work, they had to be paid and uh, they had to be fed and they had to be clothed and all that stuff. They had to have access to medical care. Um, and uh, the French at the time, in late 1944 and early 1945, were uh, annoyed, to put it the least, that the Germans were getting fed when the French were not getting fed. And the Germans had uh, shelters and were, had, had, uh, they were sheltered from the elements when the French were not. There were lots of French who were homeless. Uh, lots of them were living in, in cow sheds and things like that. And, and they couldn't see any reason why the Germans should be eating oranges uh, and the, the French were eating boiled oats. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem. And there's lots of things. I mean, I could go on and on about that. However, I must say also that is, that's mostly, or actually not mostly, but entirely in this book rather than in uh, after D-Day. Okay. So you do go into, do you go into how uh, French civilians and, and the U.S. military got along? 
yes absolutely books okay yeah yeah um what what were some of the issues there i think i i've interviewed um at least one veteran who said you know they you know at first there was the you know the disdain for the french but then as they got to know them um you know that it, it was good relations at the ground level um that sort of depends on the circumstances. And that's one of the, one of the themes actually of after D-Day is that uh, the circumstances of how the Americans and the British, uh, excuse me, Americans and the French met mm -hmm. and what happened when they met mm -hmm. uh, really had a lot to do with shaping the subsequent uh, relations between the two. For example, um, there were a lot of uh, French towns and cities in uh, Normandy, which were really, really mauled during the fighting in Normandy and mostly you know, by the Americans. Uh, the city of Valonia, for example, was almost leveled as was Saint-Lô uh, by uh, American bombers. And uh, the French people who lived there and around Saint-Lô and Valonia were uh, pretty upset about that. Mm -hmm. And so that when the Americans finally showed up, uh, American infantrymen you know, came strolling along, uh, they, they were not happy to see them. Uh, they did not give them a warm welcome with uh, apples and uh, bottles of wine and things. You know, they, uh, uh, they, were, they were highly, highly annoyed. Mm -hmm. um, it was mostly after the breakout of uh, late July, early August, when the Battle of Normandy was effectively over, that uh, the Americans encountered large numbers of French civilians who had escaped uh, rough treatment during the war. Uh, that, uh, you know, the Germans pulled out and the Americans pulled in and hey, hey, hey we're liberated. That's great. Uh, and they were very happy. You know, they were ecstatic to, to see the Americans and they got along pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, what happened, however, is that when Americans established large supply bases um, or, say, uh, airfields, there was uh, there were some areas in France that had a whole network of uh, fighter and bomber uh, airfields which meant that there were many, many thousands of, of uh, service troops and thousands of Air Force uh, personnel stationed there. Mm -hmm. um, they had a bad habit of getting drunk in riotous. Um, and uh, the French who might have uh, liked them initially um, grew not to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, but I did seem to, it seemed to find a theme that Air Force guys were particularly troublesome. Hmm. Uh, I don't know why that would have been, but they seem to have uh, perhaps more slack discipline or something. Uh, yeah. And uh, if there were air, air bases nearby in, in France, uh, the local people generally didn't appreciate the GIs too much. I'm speaking with Robert Lynn Fuller, author of After D-Day. You can find more information about the book on Amazon or the LSU Press website. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please tap the like button and bullseye the subscribe button. If you want more interviews with military historians or to get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, Check out FullContactNerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out TechnologyAndSpace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. Hmm. Now the the frustration did it ever and also considering that there were french french who collaborated with germans um, willingly like politically they felt connected you know with the whole nazi idea yeah. um were there were there issues with french actively attacking or working against the americans in france there were isolated incidents where that accusation was leveled uh, I don't know to what extent it, they were accurate. Um, let's say they, that some of these accusations were true. Uh, these were by the part of the Americans, by the way. I mean, these would be U.S. soldiers saying, hey, we were attacked by some French civilians. Mm -hmm. um, by French civilians serving uh, in the service of the Germans, you know, not uh, like, you know, pissed off fathers about their daughters or something. Mm -hmm. um, 
there may have been some incidents of that, uh, particularly in the East, in the Lorraine, uh, but I think they were very isolated. Um, and it, the, that's one of the problems I do discuss in the book is that there was a problem encountered in Lorraine that there was uh, large parts of Alsace and Lorraine were annexed to Germany by Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that the former French citizens who lived there were now German citizens, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them adopted and adapted and said, okay, I'm a Nazi, uh, and, and others didn't. So there was uh, a lot of um, what the French called the attentisme, which is uh, waiting to see what happens. Yeah. So, you know, as the winds of war blew against the Germans, you know, you, you weren't going to find that many French people, even the Lorraine, who were necessarily going to be pro-German. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were still some. Mm -hmm. uh, and moreover, uh, the Germans actually uh, brought in colonists, Germans from other parts of Germany, uh, or say Germans who had lived in what had previously been Poland or things like that, mm -hmm. and uh, planted them as colonizers in Lorraine. So that there were these communities of Germans that were living there. And when the Germans pulled out in the late 1944, uh, a lot of them got left behind. And one of the things that the Americans had difficulty doing is sorting those people out. You know, who, who were the Germans here and who were the French? Mm -hmm. um, also, the French had a problem of sorting out French POWs who were captured in German uniform, of which there were, uh, I don't know how many. I, I tried to find out. And the, the French government tried to find out too. And uh, they weren't ever actually able to ever come up with a particularly accurate number. Uh, but let's say it was uh, 160,000. Um, a lot of them deserted when given the opportunity uh, and turned themselves, they, they sought shelter with French civilians. So French civilians would often give them civilian clothes and, and say, okay, you know, you're, out of the, you're out of the German army now and you're free. However, um, I found that there was incident after incident in Lorraine where uh, GIs would show up and uh, they would find these uh, young guys who looked an awful like soldiers wearing farmer clothes. And they'd say, so, you know, what's going on here? Who, you know, who, who are these people? And the French would explain, oh, well, you know, they had been in the Wehrmacht, but uh, we, we gave them shelter and uh, they're deserters and now they're on our side. And the Americans said, no, 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 not so fast. Uh, they're POWs. So they were treated as POWs. And unfortunately, or well, I, I conclude, unfortunately, because it ended up being a pretty messy policy of the U.S. Army trying to find these guys. And there's thousands of them, tens of thousands of them. And they're sorting through these uh Eastern villages and, and towns in, in, in France, uh, treating essentially all military age males as suspect. Uh, and this made for pretty bad relations uh, in Eastern France uh, between the, all civilians um, and, uh, and, and Americans. Did, did this continue after the war, after VE Day? Or? No. <laughs> okay. Um, no, what happened after VE Day actually was um, a lot of. Boy, this actually does get, I don't know how much of the weeds you want to get here, but uh, the, you know, the Germans started having a manpower problem in fighting enough soldiers to, to man their armies after Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Germans developed a policy that said that the uh, Wehrmacht, the regular German army, could have all conscripts within greater Germany, within Germany itself. And uh, the SS got to conscript all German speaking peoples outside of Germany. So that would include Alsace and Lorraine. So uh, many, many tens of thousands of Al French from Alsace and Lorraine were conscripted into the SS, which was you know, not a place you want to be, but hmm. uh, in fact, they, they, the French have a term for that, uh, malgré nous, against our will. Uh, but they were, you know, they were dragged in against their will and made members. Mm -hmm. In 1945, uh, a lot of them were captured. You know, it's the end of the war, and uh, these these guys are captured in SS uniforms, which is not a good uniform to wear when you're captured. Right. Uh, um, and uh, they had to sort out who was who. And anybody could say, oh, yeah, I'm French, but <laughs> yeah, it wasn't necessarily true. So uh, they had to figure out what to do with these guys. So ultimately, what the Americans did is they just handed them all over to the French. They said, look, you know, this guy claims to be French. You sort it out. 
Um, and they actually were uh, French officers, military officers, who sorted through POWs in uh, camps in Germany, trying to find, you know, French citizens. Uh, and uh, we just, we being Americans, just let, you know, we let them do it, let them handle it. Um, and uh, the French were initially very uh, wary of these guys. And, you know, this guy had served in the SS, for Christ's sake. Um, can we trust them? Mm-hmm. Um, and as it turns out, uh, there were only about 50 to 100 uh, French POWs who had served in the SS who ultimately uh, refused to give the royalty to the new France. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I want to go back to 50, uh, which is a pretty small number. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, the French then had to deal with them and they weren't very nice, <laughs> very nice about it as far as I know. Yeah. So one thing I think of is um, the Americans in France is that there were certain areas, I think it's South southwestern france where there was german activity and the question is do the americans just bypass them to try to finish the war go straight into germany and just let them do whatever they they're going to do in france these german troops um i'm just curious about that situation what sort of dynamic that created you know what sort of tensions if you if you know Sure. Yeah, I do know. Uh, the Germans that left behind in southwestern France uh, retreated to uh, redoubts along the coast mm-hmm. uh, because uh, their orders from, from Berlin were to hold out in these small Atlantic coast ports like uh, uh, Lorient or La Rochelle, Bordeaux, high on the list. Um, so they set up these fortresses in these small cities and towns and just held out there. Um, so that they weren't roaming the countryside, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if they had been roaming the countryside, uh, French guerrillas would have taken care of them and did. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Not too many got left behind, but of course there were stragglers and the stragglers were treated pretty roughly. uh, In many cases, just shot and killed. Um, But uh, the Germans who held up in these uh, enclaves on the Atlantic coast remained there uh, right up until May 8th, 1945. Uh, and the reason for that was is that neither the French under de Gaulle nor the Americans working under Eisenhower cared to uh, divert the resources and manpower and supplies and ammunition that it would have taken to drive them out. Mm-hmm. Um, and after the Allies captured Antwerp in Belgium as an intact port, uh, they didn't figure they needed Bordeaux anymore. I mean, Bordeaux is awfully far from anything and uh, wasn't particularly important that get that be captured. So uh, they were they were holed up in these places, and generally, the troops, the, the French troops that surrounded them, were the, these irregular FFI, the French forces of the interior, uh, who were poorly trained, poorly equipped, mm-hmm. sometimes well led actually, um, but didn't have the resources. They didn't have the artillery to to take out these these Germans. So they just bottled them up, and their job was just to guard them, make sure they didn't go anywhere. And did you say de Gaulle was ha- was satisfied with that? Yeah, yeah. That de Gaulle, de Gaulle, as most upper level French officials that I uh, uh, researched, were pretty understanding of the limitations of what the Allies and in this case the Americans could de- could deliver. Mm-hmm. They knew that there was a shortage of shipping. They knew there was only so much dock space uh, for for them to land and, and unload and load. Uh, they knew that there was only so much supplies that the Allies could deliver. For example, uh, uh, the food situation in France got much worse after liberation. It had been better during the occupation, and that was also a source of a whole lot of grumbling on the part of a lot of the French. Uh, that uh, you know, we, we, at least we had bread. Now we don't even have bread, uh, and they expected the Americans to provide the bread, and the Americans weren't going to provide the bread because they didn't have the ships to bring the the wheat over or the 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 equipment to repair the mills or the equipment to repair the railroads or anything else. I mean, this would have been a huge, huge undertaking mm-hmm. to uh, even just bring in the supplies to provide, to, to make the bread. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the French officials understood that as did de Gaulle. So he said, well, you know, you know, sorry, uh, but uh, we, you know, we have to bring in our artillery shells are more important right now than, than bread, than mm-hmm. wheat. So, you know, so, and, and he was understanding of that as we're, the officials that I read when I read correspondence between um, American civilian affair officers um, and uh, and uh, French officials, 
there was no real bitterness on that question. But there was among the populace. <laughs> the populace were really, really annoyed. I imagine. And, and this question might be a, a bit beyond the scope of the book, but maybe not. Um, you know, the U.S., when, once it wins or conquers an area, you know, it provides aid. It, it, it helps build up, you know, the local country to some extent. So I'm curious, do you know that, can you compare and contrast how the U.S. treated Germany versus was France even considered a country to provide aid to? Oh, yeah. Is it just like, okay, you know. Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, French fr France got Lend-Lease aid. Um, and uh, Lend-Lease aid would have covered anything and everything, uh, including food that was brought in for civilian consumption or railroads or locomotives and rolling stock and uh, uh, railroad rails, things like that. Um, and uh, one thing I hadn't previously fully appreciated was that uh, they were charged for all that, you know. Right. It may be called lend lease, but it was more like sell. Uh, they, um, they, their big ledger was kept, you know, and they wrote down everything, you know, every nail that was delivered to the French, you know, it's one nail, one cent or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, but it also worked the other way uh, that uh, if we put troops up in some hotel in Marseille and we put a lot of troops up in a lot of hotels in Marseille, mm -hmm. um, we paid for that. So there was a, uh, there were charges that were against the allies and there were charges, financial charges uh, against the uh, French. And um, they were just subtracted rather than them paying for, you know, the, the locomotives. Uh, they simply said, okay, well, you can have these hotel rooms. Um, so there was a ledger was kept uh, at the end of the war. Of course, the ledger was vastly in favor of the Americans. I mean, the French owed us a lot of money, mostly for military supplies. Um, uh, and we, we lend lease ended in September, 1945, uh, much to everybody's chagrin, but then there were negotiations about, uh, loans and would the Americans give the French loans, uh, and for how much, under what terms and how long, et cetera, et cetera. And the answer was, yeah, 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 we did. We did give them loans. Although, um, I haven't done any particular research into, on, into this question. I'd be curious to know, uh, but, you know, the French never paid their World War I loans, uh, their debts, um, and they just refused to pay them. They just stopped. Uh, they had a debt that was supposed to be paid in December. I mean, a, a, a what do we call this, a payment uh, that was due in December of uh, 1932, mm -hmm. and they just refused to make it. They said, well, no, we're not, we're not paying. And there really wasn't anything Americans could do about it. Mm -hmm. And the French never paid again, not a dime, even though they still owed the United States. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I would assume that that stuck in the craw of an awful lot of Americans when it came time to loan them money in 1945. But I, I don't know quite how that worked out. It'd be interesting to find out. Hmm. I have a feeling. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, but you had asked to compare it with Germany. And I just want to say, I don't know that much about Germany. I just know incidental things about Germany. And I, I, as much as any generals to World War II would know, I suppose. I haven't done any particular research on that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think um, that the rise of communism within Western Europe was of concern to the U.S. and others mm -hmm. after the war. Yeah. Um, how big of a, and maybe, you, I, I don't know, again, this might be beyond the scope of the book, but was that a big concern in France at the time at the end of the war? Sure, yeah. Um, I, you know, I can, I can say that there's lots and lots of things I came across while doing my research that never ended up in the book. Uh, and that would be one of them. Uh, I ended up having uh, lots of notes and read an awful lot about the municipal elections of May 1945, for example, which was the first time women got to vote in France. Uh, and then the, the national elections in uh, October, I think they were, of 1945. And the Americans paid, paid close attention. There were lots of reports going back to Washington, D.C. about uh, the results of these elections and how the communists did. Mm -hmm. um, so that the Americans were very concerned about how the communists were, were performing. However, uh, up until that point, the communists had been pretty cooperative with the Americans. Um, the Americans didn't make any particular distinction between communist guerrillas, for example, and uh, non-communist guerrillas that were fighting the Germans. They're all guerrillas and you know, they all killed Germans and cooperated with the Americans and the Americans didn't much care about uh, the political affiliation. Um, 
the also the communists in France had orders from Moscow to cooperate. So the borders came in and said, don't make trouble for the Americans and don't make trouble for De Gaulle. Uh, do what you can to accommodate them. Uh, we're all in this fight together. We want to defeat the Germans. So there was really not much of a problem with the communists um, up until the end of the war. I should say though that communist publications, because the newspapers started up right away uh, with the liberation and communist newspapers they were not overtly anti-American initially. Um, they, what they did was they were just very pro-Russian. You know, they were pro-Soviet and they, they built up as much as they could uh, Uncle Joe and uh, the, the exploits of the glorious Red Army and things like that. Uh, it was really during the municipal elections of May 45 that communist propaganda turned overtly anti-American. Uh, and then from then on, it, it got worse, uh, such that it actually rose to the level of Truman protesting to uh, de Gaulle, saying, you know, it, there's this, all these lies are being spread about us in the French press, and you've got to do something about this. Uh, and de Gaulle, who was no friends of the communists, uh, agreed and said, yeah, well, we'll see what we can do. Uh, as it turns out, there really wasn't a whole lot they could do. Um, uh, but that the communists did quite well in the elections of uh, the fall of 1945. Um, and uh, together with the socialists, uh, they were the, the largest block of, uh, of deputies elected. And uh, that more or less <laughs> wrote the end for de Gaulle because de Gaulle wasn't really gonna be particularly interested in trying to cooperate with, uh, uh, with communists and socialists. Although I should also say that de Gaulle, uh, he was very good at uh, small committee politics. Um, he proved really master at out outmaneuvering people in terms of little groups, small group dynamics. But when it came to being a politician, uh, he wasn't a politician, he was a lousy politician, uh, initially anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and he hated it. He didn't like all that back, back slapping, cutting deals and negotiating and things like that. You know, he just wanted things to go his way, my way, the highway. And, and when he ran into uh, political situations where people were not willing to bend his will, then his, his previous modus of operandi had always been, all right, I'm out of here, I'm gone. And then people would say, oh, no, 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 don't leave, don't leave, come back, please, please. Uh, but of course, when he tried that uh, in the fall, actually, I think it was January 46, if I remember, uh, it didn't work. You know, he said, okay, I'm out of here. And they said, okay, see you around. So he was gone. <laughs> he was removed from the French political scene in January 1946 and didn't come back until late 1950s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm speaking with Robert Lynn Fuller, author of After D-Day. You can find more information about the book on Amazon or the LSU Press website. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please tap the like button and bullseye the subscribe button. If you want more interviews with military historians or to get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you want interviews with writers and creative people, or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out FullContactNerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out TechnologyAndSpace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. Okay, one of the things that happens in doing research is you come across all kinds of stuff that's really very tangential to your project, but fascinating. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I came across in the National Archives that was not at all related to my subject mm -hmm. uh, was a series of telegrams between uh, George Marshall, the Secretary of War, and uh, Eisenhower. Yeah, it was about uh, what to do with all these German POWs in the uh, spring of 1945 when the, the German army was surre had surrendered en masse and there was like millions and millions of these German soldiers. And um, the Eisenhower had assumed that he would use German doctors to take care of them and use German food to feed them and things like that. Uh, but there wasn't, there was no the food, the food wasn't there. Um, so the question was, what was he gonna do you know, with, with all these prisoners? How was he gonna feed them? Um, 
And this, by the way, is currently, or was in the last couple of years, a big subject in uh, Germany, because there's been claims among Germans, not very trustworthy Germans, they might say, uh, uh, who claim that like a million German POWs starved. That's nonsense. A million POWs did not starve. Uh, a million POWs were treated uh, pretty badly for a couple of weeks. That's about it. Because uh, they had no place to put them. Yeah, they got rained on. They got wet. They got cold. You know, yes, yes, all that happened. Uh, but there was no, you know, prosecutorial or persecution of uh, German POWs by the American army in the spring of 1945. But these telegrams going back and forth uh, between Eisenhower and Marshall about this very subject uh, ultimately ended when Marshall was presented with a whole bunch of photographs of American POWs who had been liberated from POW camps in Germany uh, who were skeletal. You know, these guys had been starving. Uh, they had, some of these guys hadn't eaten for weeks. They had, had no medical attention. Uh, they were in really bad shape. Um, and when, when Marshall saw those photographs, he said, I've lost interest in this subject, the uh, subject of what happens to the German POWs. I don't care. I don't care what happens to these German POWs. Uh, you deal with it. You do whatever you want to do. I don't even hear about it anymore. Just take care of it. Leave me out because I don't care. Uh, and I certainly understand that point of view. Yeah. And the problem with that being tangential to my subject was, although I read all those things, I was fascinated by reading them. I didn't even write down what boxes they were in. I don't know. I couldn't find them again if I wanted to. <laughs> if I wanted to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw these telegrams. You should, you should take a look at those. I don't know where they are. <laughs> so they were... They were someplace, uh, and I don't, I don't know where. Um, and actually, that that makes me think of. Do you get it at all into French colonial territories? Where, where was the U.S. doing anything in relation to those? Yeah, in fact, it was uh, French colonial territories, mostly in the Pacific initially. Uh, that were of interest to Americans before the United States even got into the war. In the fall of 1941, uh, you know, the Americans could smell the war coming. Uh, so began to establish bases in the Pacific Ocean uh, that would have been handy you know, in the event that we got into a war, shooting war with the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them were French islands. And uh, these were French islands who had... Uh, declared their allegiance to allegiance, allegiance to de Gaulle early on um, in 19, late 1940, early 41, mm -hmm. uh, so that the governors of these islands were, were pro-allied and the Americans approached them uh, and said, uh, you know, can we open bases here? And of course they had to defer to de Gaulle because they had pledged their allegiance to de Gaulle. And so that made the Americans have to negotiate with the wall, which previously they had refused to do uh, because Roosevelt refused to allow it. Uh, so that was the first contact between uh, the formal contact between U S government and uh, the Gaulle and his forces was over the establishment of bases in the Pacific. Um, and again, this was the war department and the war department, they were perfectly happy to treat with anybody. They, they didn't care uh, if the Gaulle was a fascist or, you know, uh, paradictator or a dictator in the making. It just didn't matter. Was, they, had the, they had the islands and Americans wanted to put uh, bases there. And so they'd be happy to deal with them. And they did. Um, but this was all the, the war department and uh, Roosevelt sort of crafted it so that all relations between the war department or between the United States and the French was through the war department and not the state department. Hmm. What about French uh, Indochina? Uh, we, that was too late. Um, the, the commander of French forces in Indochina in uh, uh, June of 1940 was a man named uh, General Georges Castro, mm -hmm. I think. I'd, I'd have to go back and look, but uh, he refused to accept the armistice when uh, Pétain signed the armistice with the Germans and said, okay, you know, the war's over and, and uh, we'll now, you know, cooperate with the Germans. Uh, uh, Castro said, no, no. <laughs> And he tried to lead the French army in Indochina into the Allied camp, but uh, the army wasn't, would have none of it. And so he had to get out of town, which he did. Hmm. Uh, and then from then on, the Indochina was uh, Vichy and loyal to Pétain. Hmm. And so ultimately, when the Japanese demanded that uh, the uh, Japanese be allowed to establish military bases and to acquire supplies, 
for the Japanese military in Indochina, the, the Vichy government said, okay, fine, you know, we'll do that. Mm-hmm. That, however, provoked Roosevelt uh, because he's, he thought, well, you know, if the Vichy is going to allow the Japanese to establish bases in French colonies, then they'll probably be willing to allow the Germans to do the same thing to French colonies in uh, Africa. And the reason why that was so important was because if the Germans established naval facilities at Dakar in Senegal, West Africa, you know, that's at the far, far Western tip of Africa, Mm -hmm. uh, that would give them a huge advantage in controlling Atlantic sea lanes. Mm -hmm. Uh, So one thing that Roosevelt and American administration generally really, really wanted to avoid was having German submarines based in Africa. Uh, So that's when the United States became very interested in uh, the disposition of those colonies. Now, a lot of those colonies had, in fact, declared themselves for de Gaulle early on. Mm. Uh, others had not declared themselves for de Gaulle, but Gaullist agents went in and uh, staged the coup d'etat and took over. Um, for example, one was uh, uh, Cameroon. Mm-hmm. Um, they just they just took over, and uh, the people of Cameroon went along with that. The French colonists who lived in Cameroon went along with it pretty easily because Cameroon had formerly been a German colony and they assumed that if Germany won the war, Cameroon would be handed back to the Germans and you know, so much for the French colonists uh, who would live there, okay. which weren't very many, I should point out, by the way, we're not talking about a big population of people. Right. right. Uh, uh, but the, uh, the governor of uh, Chad was a man by the name of Felix uh, Eboué, mm-hmm. uh, who was uh, an African and, um, and he was an African who served in the French government bureaucracy and his sympathies were entirely with de Gaulle. And so very, very early on, he got in touch with Gaullist agents and said, you know, I'd be happy to cooperate, but he wasn't going to be happy to cooperate until Gaullist agents could assure his personal safety and the safety of the, of, of, of Chad. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, when Gaullists finally showed up with arms, uh, then Abouet said, okay, fine, you know, Chad goes for De Gaulle. So then that was Chad. So it was kind of like colony by colony. It sort of went down the line. And one of the last colonies in Africa to go was uh, Senegal mm-hmm. and Dakar, uh, which remained loyal to uh, Vichy and was potentially collaborationist with the Nazis right up until the Operation Torch in uh, November of 1942. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so which, uh, which French islands in the Pacific did the U.S. set up any kind of facilities, do you know offhand? Well, New Caledonia was a, was a big one. Mm-hmm. Uh, New Caledonia was a, a particular uh, interest. The French were particularly interested in aligning themselves with the Americans because it was awfully close to uh, Japanese islands. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, once the Japanese had seized the, uh, I was going to say once the, they had seized the um, uh, Solomons from the British, but I, I think that the Caledonia had, New Caledonia had uh, aligned themselves with the Americans before that. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, there, there's, uh, there's lots of stories of intrigue about all this stuff, particularly the islands. Uh, and I'm, I'm, since I don't actually treat that in my books, this is all, this is all beyond purview of my books, okay. uh, but I had read about it. Uh, and there was actually really fascinating intrigue because there was like a Franciscan priest who, uh, uh, who was also an admiral, uh, I think, I can't remember his name, but um, uh, who ended up taking over one of the French islands in the South Pacific, I don't know if it was Tahiti or, or some, some island, um, who ended up being quite a character uh, and ultimately uh, an important character uh, in the history of the Gaullist movement. But uh, uh, for the purpose of my book, he's just a footnote, not even, not even a footnote, you won't find him in the index. That, that's funny uh, because just this morning I was doing an interview about um, medieval priests who were also fighters you know mm. warriors so it's funny that mm-hmm. you mentioned an admiral slash priest <laughs> yes admiral Agno or something like that I, i'd have to look him up mm-hmm. uh but a more a more significance i think you should probably want to know the french islands in uh, about the french islands in the caribbean mm. uh which were loyal to um to vichy mm-hmm. uh you may have seen the the film to have and have not with humphrey bogart and um Sydney Green Street, Lauren Bacall, I think, I think that was in fact her, uh, her, her debut mm-hmm. was that was supposed to be about this, you know, pro de Gaulle underground on this French island that's loyal to Vichy and they're, you know, they're trying to 
lead an uprising, which evidently is, is nothing to do with the Hemingway book, which I, I haven't read the Hemingway book. But anyway, uh, the islands in the Caribbean remained loyal to Vichy. Mm -hmm. And that was a problem for the United States as well. Oh, yeah. uh, and one of the strange things there was that uh, there was only, in 1940, there was only a single French aircraft carrier, uh, Le Baron, I think it was. And uh, it sailed to um, Martinique or Guadeloupe or one of the French islands in the Caribbean. And there it stayed throughout the war. And, um, oh, no, 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 I remember, I remember. The Baron had sailed to the United States to pick up airplanes because the Americans had sold the French a whole bunch of airplanes uh, for their fight against the Germans in 1940. Mm -hmm. And uh, before they could get back, uh, France was overrun and there's the Baron loaded up with all these American airplanes. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in the, it, it then took off for Guadeloupe and the Americans actually asked to have the airplanes back. Yeah. And uh, the French said, no, <laughs> we, we bought them. They're our airplanes now and it's our aircraft carrier. And it was down in the Caribbean. And the fact that there was this, this aircraft carrier, along with other military vessels, like Navy, Navy vessels, mm -hmm. nothing too big, I don't think. There were certainly no battleships or cruisers that I'm aware of, probably just destroyers, uh, that were stationed in the Caribbean and loyal to Pétain. And so potentially, that means they were potentially of use to the Nazis. Yeah. Uh, and this was a problem for the Americans. Uh, and they wanted to get their hands on those things, which eventually they did. Yeah. But it, it took a while. Yeah, I can imagine with the Caribbean right there that the U.S. wouldn't have too much trouble taking care of that threat when they decided to. Yeah, well, it's a distraction, though. I mean, you know, they they would have to they would have to uh, send res spend resources to do it. Um, you remember the infamous um, uh, island bases for for uh, destroyers deal that. Uh, Roosevelt had signed with uh, with Churchill in 1941, I think, mm -hmm. where uh, we gave the uh, the, the English was a hundred like a hundred uh, World War One era destroyers, mm -hmm. and in exchange, uh, the British gave us all these bases in the Caribbean. Uh, I've always thought that was kind of comedic because <laughs> what kind of a deal is that? <laughs> the, the British say, okay, we get all these destroyers. And oh, by the way, you get to take the, the security of all these islands off of our hands and you get to worry about it. And so we don't have to worry about the Caribbean. Americans don't have to worry about the Caribbean. Hey, that's a pretty good deal. And that this has always been posed as some kind of a you know stroke of genius by Roosevelt. <laughs> it always just sort of makes me laugh as I'm laughing now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the Americans did, in fact, have bases all over the Caribbean. And we had all kinds of resources down there. But I don't think we really wanted to get into a shooting war. Um, uh, it, it is beyond the purview of my book and actually of my research, although I'm sure I've read it. I just don't remember, you know, when did the Americans finally uh, get their hands on Guadeloupe and, and Martinique? I, I don't recall. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, so but I don't think there was any shooting, though. Okay. Um, well, let's turn to uh, how you did the research for the book. What, uh, what resources did you use? Well, initially, I used uh, resources uh, of the U.S. Army archives at the uh, uh, National Archives in College Park, Maryland. That's the first place I went. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to archivists there who steered me towards many helpful uh, dossiers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I was relying almost entirely on U.S. Army documents. And that's fine. And I got lots and lots of very good information that way. But, you know, if you're a competent historian, you don't want to just rely on one set of sources like that. So uh, the next place I went was the Military History Institute, in, uh, which is the research institute attached to the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about the, the MHI, which now is called something else, uh, I don't, the Army Heritage Center or something like that, um, is that lots and lots of veterans who write up their, uh, mem their uh, memoirs of their experiences, regard regardless of the war, it could be the Philippines War or uh, the Spanish-American War, or whatever. And they don't, don't know what to do with them or the family doesn't know what to do with them after they pass away. And so they end up at the MHI. Uh, and same thing happens with lots of letters and diaries. Uh, so lots of letters and diaries of letters and diaries of GIs who fought World War II, were veterans of World War II, uh, ended up at the MHI and you can consult them. 
which I did. <laughs> and I found some amazing stuff there, very good stuff. Um, but then of course, uh, I had to go to France. So uh, I went to four departmental archives, uh, department of France being roughly the equivalent of a state, mm-hmm. uh, and looked at uh, local official reports from those departments. Um, there's been a lot of work done on uh, France in the one particular archive in the department of Calvados, which is up in Normandy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the lots and lots of things that you'll come across uh, is from Calvados. Um, I didn't go to Calvados because I figured it's been done. Why should I go to Calvados? And anyway, Calvados is in the British sector of Normandy and it hardly addresses the Americans. So there's a lot more information available about the British presence in Normandy than there is about the American presence in Normandy. Mm. And the principal reason for that is that uh, the archives in the, the American sector are in a department called La Manche. And uh, the, the, the head, the chef le, uh, the principal city of La Manche mm-hmm. uh, is uh, Saint-Lô, which got leveled. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when it got leveled, the archives got leveled. And so it took many, many, many years for the French to put back together again, the archives in Saint-Lô. Mm-hmm. And the archives from the World War II era have only become available in the last, I don't know, five, six years, something like that. Um, I did not go there because I did my research there before they, before they came available. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did go to Nancy, which is in Lorraine. Um, the, the other big city in uh, Lorraine is Metz. And uh, the archives in Metz suffered the same fate as the archives in Saint-Lô. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were burned. So the, arc, the World War II era archives in, in Metz are not available. There's nothing there. Um, so I went, but I did go to Nancy, and Nancy had lots and lots and lots of great stuff. Mm-hmm. So I used uh, Nancy, I went to Marseille, and I went to the archives of Marseille, which were very helpful and show up mostly in this book, because I discuss the, um, the American control of the port of Marseille. The Americans effectively took over the port and made it an ally supply depot. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's lots and lots of great information about that. Uh, and then I went to two other archives, one in a town called Auxerre and another in Troyes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to Troyes because I knew there was the big mil- the big uh, Air Force establishment outside of Troyes in uh, a, a huge complex, um, which remained after World War II, by the way. We kept those bases uh, up until the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I discovered <laughs> those troublesome uh, Air Force guys. Yeah. And I went to Auxerre because I knew from my research in the National Archives that there had been essentially a GI riot in Auxerre uh, that had provoked a real serious incident between the American government and the French government uh, because the 101st Airborne was stationed there in July of 1945 after they were pulled out of Germany and were waiting to come back to the United States or go to the Pacific as fate would have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they just got drunk and bored and uh, went on a, a, a rampage. Um, which was a real problem. So I wanted to find out about that, and, and I did. And that also shows up in uh, you know, the post, post-liberation book in this book. How many, uh, so how that many, was my rationale. How many, and then, of course, many, I went to the National Archives of Paris, which had lots and lots of information. Mm-hmm. How, how many Americans were involved in the, that riot? Well, uh, it would have been the 101st Airborne, which was, uh, I think, about 17,000 troops, something like that. So are you saying like almost all of them were? Oh, how many were rioting? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, how many arrests were made? Or uh, uh, it's uh, it's a I I I have criminal figures uh, gathered by the French police uh, up for the for the month of March 1946 after the Americans were gone, mm-hmm. and uh, there were weeks and weeks where the report said nothing to report. Mm. Nothing. Uh, in fact, in the entire spring of 1946, uh, the French arrested, I think, one woman for stealing something and uh, uh, one Frenchman for uh, disorderly conduct when he was drunk. Yeah. That's it. But if you look at the French police reports for August or July of 1940, uh, 45, it's just long, long, long lists. Of, uh, of cafes that were busted up and cars that were stolen and people were beat up and women that were raped. And uh, it was a problem. Uh, there was like 
25, 26 incidences a day. Um, so how many GIs does it take to provoke that? I, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, my question, my pose in the book when I write about this was, where were the officers? What were they doing? Uh, why, why weren't they having their men under control? And, and they clearly didn't. Um, this did not go on and on and on, by the way. I mean, it did come to a stop, but it took a while. It, you know, this was a period of like two weeks of chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, and the French really, really resented it. Were, were there other parts of France that had huge criminal incidents by Americans? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Weird. Paris. Okay. <laughs> there were evidently... Uh, there were gangs of, uh, of deserters, American deserters, who just took up criminal gangs uh, in, in league with, uh, with French. Um, you know, there's a monstrous black market, uh, mostly in stolen uh, U.S. Army property. Uh, uh, gasoline, cigarettes, sugar, things like that, coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, and all this stuff is very valuable in the black market. And that's principally what these American gangs did. They, they stole stuff and they acted as middlemen and... Uh, funneled it to French gangsters who sold on the French black market. Um, so yeah, um, there was also, there was, I, I had one report of some Americans who just went berserk and were just shooting up a street in Paris. Uh, um, and uh, the Americans tried to capture them. MGs tried to, MPs tried to try to get these guys and uh, they got away. So they didn't know who they were. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know about that. All that. <laughs> yeah, it was a problem. Uh, in fact, initially, my, my chapter, which is a short one in the struggle for cooperation about uh, the incident in Auxerre, was initially really an examination of paratroopers overall, uh, because it wasn't just Auxerre. I mean, it, it was the incident in Auxerre which got me interested in the question of allied American paratroopers. Actually, I should stick with allied because it turns out the British paratroopers were also something of a problem. Uh, they had a very bad reputation. And uh, British paratroopers in, in the Netherlands, for example, uh, evidently ran amok and uh, the, the Dutch uh, lodged a big protest with the, uh, the British government about the behavior of their paratroopers. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Amer American paratroopers caused problems in Germany and then they caused problems back in, the United, back in uh, France before they even got to Auxerre. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was, uh, I can't remember, uh, there was one one division which was never actually activated, the 13th, I think, the 13th Airport Division, I'm not sure, uh, who also caused lots of problems and they never even got in, into the fight. So uh, the explanation that um, uh, uh, Maxwell Taylor, sorry, I, I couldn't think of who, who was the, the general, gave was, in Auxerre was more or less, yeah, you know, boys will be boys. They had a tough time in Germany, you know, they're, you know, they, they had to blow off some steam and, you know, so, you know, don't go too rough on them. You couldn't even make that excuse for the 13th. You know, they never even saw combat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what did you find? What was most surprising to you? So obviously you've put out two books based on this research, but so overall, what was the most surprising thing uh, you came across? Uh, most surprising thing. It's hard to say because, uh, like I said at the beginning, I really didn't know anything about this when I started out. Uh, so everything was news to me. Um, I had, uh, I guess I was surprised by the size of the black market. I, I thought at one point I might make that a special project to look further into that. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of material in the black market, but I wasn't particularly interested. I mean, why well, wasn't wasn't as if I was going out and doing research in the black market, but I just happened to stumble across all kinds of stuff that was incidental to my research. Mm -hmm. And when I gathered it all together, I had enough to make half of a chapter about that. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised how big it was. I was surprised at the amount of gasoline. You know, the, the army engineers built these two pipeline systems, one coming up from the Mediterranean that went up the Rhone Valley to, uh, to uh, Dijon, up to Burgundy. And the other one came in at Cherbourg uh, and went east across northern France to pipe gasoline um, to tanks and trucks and jeeps and things. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed that the amount of gasoline had never made it. Uh, wow. You know, that they would, millions and millions of gallons were siphoned off. 
And the question was, who was, who was siphoning? Where did it go? Uh, and the answer was, it all went to the black market. And some of it was siphoned off by French gangsters. Uh, but evidently, most of it was siphoned off by American GIs, um, one way or another, you know. Um, and supply trucks would go missing. You know, there's supposed to be a truck full of sugar that's supposed to be heading to uh, a recreational depot, and, and it never made it. You know, where where to go? What happened to that? What happened to all that sugar? Well, it went on the black market. Um, I was I was pretty surprised by all that. I suppose. I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because I've certainly heard that there were deserters and, and this sort of activity in Italy when the U.S. was in Italy. So I yeah. shouldn't be surprised it happened in France too, but but I am. I don't know. Why. Yeah. Well, also lots and lots of stuff disappeared at the docks. Um, and uh, a lot of that was by French dock workers, you know, who made a sideline of stealing, <laughs> stealing Amer American supplies. Uh, there was a big shortage of uh, shoes in France in 1944-45. So lots of boots disappeared. And it wasn't so much that they wanted the boots as they wanted the soles. Rubber soles. Rubber soles. Oh, man. Right. Yeah, they could get a fortune for that. And, wow. and they did. And then you have, well, I guess organized crime already existed in the U.S., but, um, but you had a, just similar stuff going on in the U.S. after the war, you know, with organized crime. and Yeah dock workers and stealing stuff, supply, tr you know, trucks. Yeah, actually, I once had, I, I, I had a student, I wanted him to do a, a, a project on uh, pre-World War II crime rates in the United States. This would have been South Carolina uh, versus post-World War II crime rates and see if, you know, if the war, which lay in between, had anything to do with it. Uh, but that, that project fizzled because it turns out that it, information was awfully hard to come by. I don't know why, but it shouldn't have been. Yeah, I had no a previous Sorry. interview um, with a historian who, who strongly suspected but couldn't quite prove that um, basically during the war in LaGuardia, LaGuardia was using mobsters to protect New York yeah. wharfs and also, I guess, certain individuals in Italy who were brought up by the U.S. to govern were connected with organized crime. And, and so you had this whole swirl of organized crime I think Tony Scotto or something like that was the New York uh, boss of the New York boss of the of the longshoreman who was a mafia guy. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the it, mafia links in Italy became a, a, a propaganda point among the French when they were arguing about have, trying to keep the Americans really, really at arm's length as far as having control over anything. Because uh, they said, well, look, you know, we handed Italy over to the Americans. And look what happened. You know, they just handed it over to the mafia. And we certainly don't want them doing that here in France. Now, that was mostly propaganda because, you know, that wasn't going to happen in France. Um, you know. And also, let me just say one more thing about black market in that an awful lot of the stuff that disappeared from American stores uh, was just petty theft. It was small stuff, small change. Uh, it wasn't big gangs. It was just, you know, a couple of GIs saw the opportunity to sell a couple of cans of peaches to, uh, you know, a restaurant in Dijon. And they did, you know, and they, in exchange, they got a couple of bottles of uh, champagne or uh, cognac or something. And man, it was small time stuff like that. There, and I think an awful lot of pilfering was very, very small time stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the U S army recognized that although that was a problem, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a monstrous problem and that they generally didn't go down too hard on them. Those guys didn't get hard, hard labor, for example. You know, they would get docked, you know, get on KP and stuff. They would get dock pay and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, there were, there were in fact, gangs who stole huge amounts of cigarettes you know, and funneled them to the French. Hmm. What um, was there a particular question that you wanted to answer that took a lot of work and either you did get an answer you were satisfied with or you still would love <laughs> to figure it out? Uh, um, this doesn't ex address that question exactly, but one of the few things I did know, I knew some anecdotes about uh, the American presence in France during the war. Uh, and one of them was that there was this thing called the Red Ball Express, which was this uh, system of trucks that was set up that was supposed to barrel supplies from Normandy to the east all the way to Lorraine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because the French railroad network just wasn't working, so they had to rely on trucks to take the place. 
but it, it was terribly, terribly abusive in the trucks. It used up monstrous amounts of gasoline and they went through like thousands of tires a day. Um, uh, and it just wore out the trucks. It was terrible. Uh, and, it, and it monopolized these roads. It, these roads became American property, essentially. We requisitioned these roads and said, okay, these are US Army roads and no one else can drive on them. Um, I knew that existed and, uh, and I wanted to find out more about that. Uh, and my very last day in the archives, um, when I no longer had any more, in the French archives, I should say, uh, I no longer had any more time. Um, I, I had one more dossier I hadn't gone through. And I said, well, let's see what's in this dossier. And it, there was a folder like this thick called Red Ball Express. So that was all about the French side and the French take on this thing. And I never got to look at it. So, uh, uh, oh, well. It's there. Um, <laughs> There were lots of things that were a little bit disappointing. Um, there were camps for displaced persons in the South uh, around Marseille uh, that I wanted to write about those. Uh, there was one in particular called Camp 401, which held people of suspicion, you know, suspect. Uh, we don't know who these people are. We think they're dangerous and we need to investigate them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's in the archives in Marseille, there were large, large folders uh, on this camp 401, but all they were were just, a lot of them were just index cards uh, that were people's names. And that's it, that's all it said, you know, that just is not very helpful, but to get thousands and thousands and thousands of these index cards, and was, you know, I, I can't do anything with this. So I didn't, uh, they ended up not having very much to say about it. Hmm. Um, was there anything you came across that had a strong emotional impact on you, either positively or negatively? Yeah, yeah, I'll say. Uh, um, in fact, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to post this, but I came across a picture in uh, the National Archives in College Park mm -hmm. um, of uh, there was a town called uh, Orador sur Glen mm -hmm. uh, in France that was uh, the, uh, the inhabitants were massacred by the SS as they were going through in 1944, in the summer of 44. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, right there in the archives, there was this picture of uh, all these schoolgirls. Uh, this was their class picture that was just taken that spring and uh, they were all dead. You know, they were all massacred. Uh, they were burned to death in a church uh, by the SS. And uh, boy, that still makes me choke up. Yeah. Just thinking. Yeah. I can, I mean, if you want, I can share that. I can include that picture with the show notes if you want me to. Sure. Yeah. If you I'd be happy to uh, send it to you. Um, so wh what, what in the research you did was most enjoyable for you? Um, I always enjoy these little French cities. Um, I'd never been to Auxerre before and I really loved it. Um, I mean, I just love going there and uh, uh, eating the food and uh, mixing with the people and talking to the people in the archives and who are all very friendly. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I'm in France, uh, I've, I've been to a lot of French archives at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I go to one of these provincial archives in uh, these little towns, little towns, they're not little towns, you know, they're, they're big towns, but they're little cities. Mm. Um, the French are always very, very welcoming. You know, they say, ah, oh, you know, a serious scholar who's come to our town to do serious research is going to become a book, you know, and they treat you like, uh, like you want to be treated, you know, with a great deal of respect and take you very seriously. They'll go way out of the way for you and um, they'll do everything they can to, to accommodate you. And I've, that's always, that's a great pleasure. That's, uh, I like that. Do you, uh, uh, have you, uh, I don't know if you can include, would it be able to include stuff like this in the book, but do you ever have people who talk about, oh yes, my parents would tell me, you know, blah, blah, blah about such and such subject that you were looking into or. Um, you mean French? Yeah. French, French people oh. giving you anecdotes of, of stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry you asked me that question. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Um, I was uh, cornered by a French woman who had been in the resistance. She was Jewish, oh. um, had been in the resistance in Nancy. And um, she wanted to tell me all about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very tired. It was, uh, she more or less cornered me at night. I was really tired. And uh, my spoken French is actually not great. It's okay. It's, it's, uh, you know, I can get by and uh, um, I can hold simple conversations and, but I, she just chatted away like a mile a minute and I, I got almost nothing. You know, I, I, 
I couldn't understand what she was saying. And uh, I just sort of had to pretend, you know, nod politely. Uh, uh, so I, 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 she probably had lots of interesting things to say. And I caught some of it, uh, but I missed most of it. So you know, that wasn't very, that wasn't very helpful. Uh, but I, I might say talking to uh, American, older American vets, you know, I, uh, who I would talk to just incidentally, people I just happen to meet, uh, not research subjects. And I say, well, I'm doing this subject about, you know, Americans in France. And uh, they would start off on these stories. And, oh yeah, I was there one time. And they almost never had anything useful to say. <laughs> it was just like, oh, my friend Pete was, you know, he's a great guy. He loved baseball. And, oh, it's useless. I mean, it was mostly, and in, in, I'm not a professional interviewer, you know, so there's probably techniques mm -hmm. for interviewing people. I don't know what they are. Um, and, uh, but these conversations almost always went nowhere. So yeah. I, that didn't but work out very well. Research-wise, I would say. Research -wise, they, went <laughs> they, were, they were not useful for, for research, no. But, yeah. I mean, they were perfectly nice men, nice yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's yeah. the danger with oral histories and, and people just talking about what they want. Yeah. Uh, I might say I've, I've come across oral histories in other projects and a little bit for this project, not much. And generally, I find them not very useful. Um, you, know, you might find little tiny scraps of information. If you've got an oral history that's going to put in the tight script and it goes on for 25 pages, you know, you might find a paragraph that's of some use, but mm -hmm. you know, mostly huh. at least not for the subjects I've been looking at. Okay. Interesting. What do you hope the book will do apart from filling the historical gap? What else would you like people to take away? Well, that's hard to say. Um, I hope people find it interesting. I tried to write it so it was accessible to people who are not specialists. Um, I didn't write it for professional historians, although I certainly expect if professional historians will be able to get a lot out of it. Um, but I tried to make it accessible to anybody who's interested in World War II uh, and has a particular interest in France. Um, and it's funny the number of people I, I run into, just people on the street or people at the YMCA or something, who say, oh, yeah, oh, I love, I love history of France. <laughs> you do? <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, and so, you know, if all these people buy the book or even get it out of a library, you know, that'd be nice. Uh, um, I might, I might actually uh, divert, uh, sidetrack for just a second when I was talking about libraries in that uh, uh, I suppose like anybody who writes books, I'm a little bit vain about them and I like to track them and see, you know, how, how, how are they doing in libraries? You know, are libraries holding them? Mm -hmm. uh, and I've noticed so far that this book after D-Day has showed up in very, very few libraries. And I think that's all due to COVID, um, that they're just not processing books. Uh, they're not adding. Um, you know, I think that um, in my imagination, you know, books are piling up and on loading docks and libraries from coast to coast and they're not being added to the collections or, or it's very slow process because uh, the workers are working from home or, or working part time or, you know, they work in these shifts so that there's not so many people in the room at one time. And it's very slow. Um, usually the Library of Congress will catalog a book pretty quickly and get that catalog number out there. Mm -hmm. um, this does have, a, I think this has got a Library of Congress catalog number in it. But I've noticed, uh, I looked up the Library of Congress. Uh, it does not. It does not have a Library of Congress number, which is unusual. Usually they do before publication. Um, uh, I've looked up Library of Congress and the book's not there and normally would be there by now. So I'm assuming that they're operating under some kind of COVID rules. Uh, so COVID, COVID is a problem in getting this book out. Uh, and I'm sorry about that. And, uh, you know, I don't take it personally, <laughs> it's, but it's, uh, you know, it's a problem. Yeah, I think I've anecdotally, I think one other person mentioned noticing an issue with libraries um, not working as quickly as, as normal. In fact, noticeably slow. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I've, I've wanted to go on and start another subject because, you know, this one's all done or potentially all done if I don't want to go back and look at those dossiers in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I recently moved from uh, Bloomington, Indiana, where I had access to uh, Indiana University's library collection, which is a good collection, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, Richmond, and uh, where we had VCU and University of Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, University of Richmond. And I'd like to get access to their collections, but I can't do it because uh, I can't just stroll into those libraries under the current conditions and say, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'd you know, like to you know, 
become a, a, a member, you know, whatever one does, you know, to check out books. Uh, but I can't do it because uh, it's limited to staff and students only. So, and I can't even wander into the history department of ECU and say, hi, uh, I'm so-and-so. And, you know, got anybody want to talk to me about something? And uh, normally I could do that, but I can't do it now. So I'm, I'm isolated and uh, unable to pursue any serious research. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. And National Archives is closed too, by the way. So, you know, I couldn't even go back to the National Archives. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you have any difficulties getting this, uh, this book uh, finished or published? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they, I would say they're all my problems. You know, they're my, they're my fault. Uh, I, you know, I dropped the ball in a number of, a number of cases. Um, I had uh, sent a proposal to LSU. Uh, you know, here's, here's my, here's my proposal for a book. And, you know, without actually sending them the manuscript. And I say, you know, are you interested? And uh, the head of the LSU press wrote back and said, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're interested. Send us the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never saw the email. And I'm not exactly sure why. I think I know why, because I was out of town when it arrived. But when I got back, I somehow just got lost in the shuffle and uh, I never saw it. And uh, I just stumbled across it like eight months later. It's like, oh my God, uh, oh, oh no, <laughs> I can't believe it. Uh, and meanwhile, no one else has expressed any interest in it. So, you know, I wrote back to LSU and I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, I, I didn't read your email. Um, are you still interested? They said, yeah, sure. So, you know, from then from then on, I, I like to say that the, the publishing process for LSU has been great. They've been wonderful. They've been a very, very good press uh, and uh, very helpful to me and um, very cooperative, very, very fast. You know, they, they're, they really... Uh, from the time I submitted the, the manuscript to the time it appeared as a book was um, about a year, which is almost a record, you know, for yeah. university presses. Uh, usually, it's not that fast. It's it's a real slow process. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, do, you, do you have a website or social media where people can follow any updates or on your, on your work or your thoughts? Uh, the short answer is no. No, I don't. I have a Facebook page, uh, but it's not particularly professional. Um, I, I once tried to do that many years ago when, when all this stuff first started and uh, it went nowhere. You know, and <laughs> Nobody visited. So, you know, I just, I never pursued it again. So no, I do not. Uh, I don't have a web page. I guess that, yeah, they can go to the publisher site then or even Amazon to just check out the book and take a look. Yep. At, at That's true. Such. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it hasn't been reviewed any place yet, so there's no reviews to read. Mm -hmm. uh, it usually takes a while for reviews to come out anyway. I mean, I think that under the current conditions, it's probably going to be even longer. So I don't expect to see any reviews for quite a while. Right, right. Um, okay, well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final or any parting thoughts or words? <laughs> um I guess I don't. No, Chris, uh, I certainly appreciate uh, you asking me uh, to be a guest on your, your program, and uh, I've enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope uh, your, uh, your viewers enjoy it. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for speaking with me. Uh, it's been my pleasure. In the next episode, I speak with Karsten Jensen and Stephen Bennett about medieval warfare between Christian and non-Christian kingdoms in Central Europe and Scandinavia. Bullseye the subscribe button to catch that episode. Thank you for watching this video version of Military History Inside Out. If you like the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you're looking for military history and general history including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Spacewalks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Thank you for watching.